Stalingrad Besiege is a very simple, very straightforward and somewhat abstract war game. Actually, it is abstract to the point that one may see it as a war-themed game. Uh, some of you will barely see it as a war game, maybe as a war game-ish game. In any case, the game is based on the Battle of Stalingrad. It takes place in uh, the city of Stalingrad itself. Uh, it's placed on a map divided into rectangles so we have a grid not hexes not some of the other fancy wargaming stuff and the game is based on the same game system as Hastings uh, 1066 that came out maybe last year for Whittington Publisher which is the same publisher as Stalingrad Besieged. Stalingrad Besieged is for two players and I guess you can play solitaire there even is a solitaire system uh, in the rules that you can use to automatize one of the sides, but it is really about bluffing and it is so therefore a game that is so much better when played with with humans with a human opponent. Here you have a full look of the map. The side player will set up on this side of the board here. The side player will also place tokens representing two fairy points and a tank factory. And these are the <clears throat> objectives of the game. The German player starts there and pushes in this direction, trying to take control of these objectives. The Russian player is trying to defend them. And so at the end of the game, at the end of seven turns, uh, the player who did uh, best at defending or attacking these objectives will win the game. And also there are different levels of victory based on how many of these objectives you were able to take or defend. Now, interesting enough, the game <clears throat> is played with military units that come in three flavors. That is, the same military units that you used to play the game are represented in three different ways, by three different uh, types of game pieces. And actually the rulebook didn't explain that, so I struggled to realize why there were so many more game pieces that you needed. Basically, you can play the game using these uh, cardboard tiles that just go on the board like so. And at the beginning of the game, most units will be face down. They become face up when they can see each other, which is when they are at the distance of one intervening, <coughs> one intervening square. But otherwise, for most of the time, and especially at the beginning of the game, many units will be face down. So you can use these large cardboard tiles. So you can use cards. Cards. Or, and it is my favorite way of playing, you can use wooden blocks. In this case, the wooden blocks, uh, you place them standing up on the board with the back facing the opponent and the sticker with the information facing the owning player. And then you reveal them when they are at the distance to see each other. The only thing is that in this case, uh, when you play with these, these blocks are pretty small. And so they're somewhat comically small when seen on, on the board, which a board has been designed, of course, to be able to hold those larger components. But this is how I like to play. Now, what you have... Uh, Oopsie. What you have here, the information, of course you have the name of the unit, an illustration, then you have the attack factor, the defense factor, and the movement factor. So as we said, players will set up following the instructions on the board, some units will be seeing each other, some of the units not so much. And here we go, just an example. The board is divided into rectangles, as we said, but also into three sectors. So three sectors, and you can see them here. Units have to move and attack within a sector, so movement is pretty limited until you break a sector, which is when you eliminate all the units from that sector. Then the sector is broken, the side, the loss, it cannot get in there anymore, and you can move your units out. If you play Stalingrad, I mean, um, Hastings at 1066, then you know this, uh, this this idea because it is the same idea there, it is the same game system, and in fact the two games are very similar. Here we also have event cards uh, that do just what event cards do, they trigger effects, so usually you just play a card and you do what the card says, you may have uh, different effects based on which player plays it. You may have reinforcements. Reinforcements only come in when you play a card. Uh, replacements also. So this is how it works. Now, 
Each turn you start by, uh, if you want, playing an option card, that's the technical name for these event cards, you may be able to get replacements if you play the correct card. To play replacements you need to have two units of the same type that have been eliminated before, so in there in your eliminated pile. Then you take one out of the game permanently and the other one becomes a replacement that you can put on the board. So you put together the remaining forces of these two units to get a full unit. And this actually was upside down, so that bothered me. Next, uh, players will alternate taking turns. So the German player goes first and the active player can first move any and all of their units. I'm gonna add some more units on the board so it doesn't look too empty. So the active player can move any and all of their units. Units can only move orthogonally, they move up to the full movement allowance, for example. And um, the only units that can move diagonally are tanks, so instead of moving two orthogonally, they can move one diagonally. That's the, and that's the exception. And again, let's see, let's, uh, let's reveal units that would be seeing each other. So, one player moves any and all of their units, again, usually within their sector, and then combat is resolved. But this is interesting, because combat, no matter who the active player is, who just resolved movement, combat, in combat, players alternate declaring attacks. So, any unit that is in range to attack and do so. So basically being active player, say the German player is the active player, only means that you declare the first attack. Say, I'm gonna attack, use this unit to attack that unit. We resolve that attack, then we mark that German unit as one that already attacked. And then the side player gets to declare an attack. Okay, I'm gonna use this unit to attack that one. We resolve that attack and then back to the German player. Some units have uh, better range. So infantry, for example, needs to be adjacent to the opponent. Artillery can uh, attack at a range, so this artillery will attack that one. Uh, we mark it as attack, and so on and so forth. So actually the attack phase is resolved by both players, both turns, uh, every turn. That means that in each game turn there will be two attack phases, one after the German movement phase and one after the Soviet movement phase. That also means that the first couple of turns are going to be totally bloody, a lot of losses are going to happen. The first turn or two, when there are a lot of units on the board, are going to take almost as long as the remaining five turns, because then you don't have so many units, uh, and then you're just maneuvering those few units, bringing them in position, maybe you'll have two, three combats total. So, that's that's a strange, uh, there's a strange uh, change in the pace there, as the first turn or two or so, immensely bloody and full of combat, and then it becomes more about maneuvering. But that's, that's I, I, I reread the rules several times to be sure that I got that right, and I think that's, that's what the rules tell me to do, and also that's how I play the game. So, that's how I'm gonna describe it. As for combat, when you are attacking, and suppose we have um, this unit is attacking that unit. Oh, that's not gonna be easy. You start with the attack factor of the attacker, that would be 5. You modify based on the defense factor of the defender, so 5 plus 1 is 6. That is the number to hit. You roll a die, if you roll the number higher, then you destroy the unit of the opponent. There is no step reduction, it is your full strength or you're dead. If this unit was attacking that one, 3 modified by 0, then the number to hit is a 3. Um, and so that also means that low attack values are good because that, of course, generates low generates low numbers to hit and high defense values are good. So this one attacking that one, three plus one is four. This one attacking that one, three plus two is five. Those are the numbers to hit. There are modifiers based on, say, for example, if you are attacking an enemy from the flank while the enemy is engaging the front, then you get a plus one. If you're attacking an enemy from the back while the enemy is engaged in the front, then it's a plus two. Anti-tank artillery has different 
attack values. The first one is when you're attacking anything but tanks. The second one when you're attacking tanks at a distance of two, because that's the range. And the last one when you're attacking tanks adjacent to you. So right there in your front, like that would be the case. So, well, this is the general flow of the game. Players will, again, they can play an event, an option card at the beginning of their turn. If allowed by the card, they may get replacements or reinforcements. Then the first player moves and both players declare and resolve attacks. The second player moves and both players declare and resolve attacks. And you continue like this until the end of the game. At that point, you adjudicate the game and you determine the winner and the level of victory based again on control of these locations on the board. Stalingrad Besiege. The first thing to say about it is also the first thing you'll notice is that the rulebook is really bad. Uh, I'm not a big fan of rulebooks in general. It's not a genre that I enjoy reading particularly. This one is particularly hard to get into. For a game this simple that I basically already knew, I still struggle learning it. There are some really just quirky turns of phrases, things are phrased in a way that just uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense from like, oh, each turn you get two reinforcements. Okay, I get it. The following sentence, but you get reinforcements only if you play a card. Okay, so why don't you tell me you get reinforcements only if you play a card up to two per turn. That would be more things. Combat system, uh, I I would say I mainly deduced it from the components and my knowledge of wargaming that from the phrasing in the rulebook because where you add the bonuses, where you add the penalties, from the phrasing doesn't make a lot of sense. It's a game that for its complexity would work perfectly well for beginners, but it doesn't have a beginner's level rulebook. You need to know about wargaming to be able to puzzle out the game from the from the rulebook and from the components mainly. So there is there is that. So sad. That's I well, I wish it had a better rulebook. The game itself, once you figure it out, is very simple, even simplistic, even too simplistic for some of you or some of us. It doesn't always feel like a war game. On the other hand, for example, I played it with a player that was completely new to war gaming and he was able to play it because adding this and adding that and moving on a grid uh, that looks a little bit like a chessboard, that was easy enough. So definitely a beginner level war game with the caveat, but is it a war game? Yeah, it, it teaches some basic concepts of war gaming. It teaches one of the ways in which you resolve combat, which is, of course, Number to hit can be modified by position, by armor, and by different things. Uh, we also know that from Dungeons and Dragons, so if you have a new player, that will also be something that will be familiar to them, because that in turn comes from Wargaming, since Dungeons and Dragons was created as a, as a Wargame expansion, not as a role-playing game or anything that was supposed to stand on its own legs. So, definitely something that if you have a war gamer teaching it to a new player, can appeal to new war gamers, can be in that sense a perfect introductory war game. The flow and pace of the game is a little bit strange because you have this big bloodbath in the early turns. So if we played it right, from how we figured out from the rules, you had this big bloodbath in the early turns and then you are two, three, four, five units per sector, and so you have a little bit of maneuvering, but also because of that, then it's a little harder to get those bonuses for flanking, which only apply if you have a coordinative action of somebody in the front and somebody on the flank. You have massive random element as you're rolling dice a lot, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's one of those games where you roll enough that uh, that odd, weird, uh, extreme results even themselves out where you do start have, have enough rolls that you do get that curve, you do get that belt, which is because everybody will get a couple of crazy good results, a couple of terrible results, and overall a lot of more or less what you expect results. So, uh, despite the fact that the game feels uh, quote unquote a little less interesting or exciting as it goes by because, uh, well, because you have fewer units, because the big climatic battle is in turn one and turn two. That's unusual. In truth, there are there is tension that can mount because then you have fewer units, the German player probably looks hopeless, how can I even 
get there at this point. I lost almost everybody. But probably the Soviet player used their best units or lost some of their best units. And so, although as a German player you're partially or significantly depleted, then you're going there for the final push. You don't have a lot of people that can perform the final push, but the Soviet player doesn't have many defenders. And so it turns out that the last couple of turns can actually be tense and can have, can, they can have some interesting tension, although it's in a different way because now it's about these last survivors will they be able to inflict the final hit or to resist uh, from the from the coup de grace so there is there is that it's an interesting and strange flow that overall works so in general it is a good war themed war game-ish game it doesn't necessarily always feel like a war game but it probably is if it had a better rule book, well, then you would have a, a much better experience. I'm still not 100% sure that I played the game right. Uh, so if I didn't, well, welcome to my to the review of my variant. So my variant is a game that I enjoy playing. That could be a little bit of a filler war game slash war gamerish uh, game because you can play it in about an hour. Maybe even less if you don't play until the end, and by turn 5 you more or less get a sense of how it's gonna go and you call it early, which can be fun. So a filler word game-ish game, it's not bad to have, just a one more arrow in your quiver. So, enjoyable, not groundbreaking, not uh, transcendental, but for what it is, which is again a filler with a war theme, a very simple game to play, something you can play with no word gamers, then mm, not bad. Not bad.